was a good friend. And let's listen to Pavarotti. Put on Pavarotti. Hello. Welcome to The Reveal. I'm your host, Pavarotti, and I'm here to discuss the Idaho 4 case. As a disclaimer, this channel is for entertainment purposes. These are my opinions. I'm not here to slander anyone. I do plan to provide some information. Any of the opinions based on the information that I provide are mine and mine alone. So let's get into it. In a recent video series, actually, as I went through the DNA, I made some observations about some things. And one of the observations that I made was the fact that the interactions that I've looked at as it regards to 1112 King Road were interactions that I considered odd by law enforcement and the residents and just some of the happenings around the house. As I further investigated the case and I started to uncover real connections into the criminal organizations that seem to just revolve around this case, well, it started to become clear to me what was going on at 1112 King Road. In my opinion, I may be incorrect, but I made the suggestion that it could have possibly been a safe house. Now, when I'm referring to a safe house, and I believe that if it was a safe house that the university had used this particular property on more than one occasion for these purposes. Now, when I'm referring to a safe house though, I don't want to get it confused with known safe houses, right? Like I had some really good comments and people were discussing like uh, battered women's shelters. That That is a great example of a known safe house. And um, and there's strict rules around those and that's that's not what I'm talking about here at all. What I'm referring to here is in the WITSEC program, what they refer to as alternate measures. And alternate measures are kind of a program in a program. And they're typically used for informants, witnesses, their families, when the threat level is not deemed to be that high. But there, there still seems to be a threat level that exists. So in precautionary measures, what they will do is take a, a residence that's not known to anybody, and it's just a simple different residence than one that they're used to living in. And with a college town like this, when you have you know, children of people that may be may be involved in some things with law enforcement and the criminal underworld where the, th the threat level could be elevated. So what they will have them do is move into a residence where minimal security measures are taken in that residence. And really what it is, if you want to get right down to it, it's law enforcement's way of making the informants, the witnesses, people that are involved in the scenario that we're discussing feel a little better that law enforcement is taking additional steps to protect the people that they love. And I could go on and on and on, but it's just me talking. So what I've done is I've taken and I've copied and pasted out of the Department of Justice's basically outline and description of their WITSEC program. And their WITSEC program is very vast, so I've taken specific parts of their WITSEC program and basically have copied and pasted it and created a video for you. Now, in this video, I'm not gonna be narrating. I'm simply gonna let the Department of Justice's guidelines and explanations narrate this entire video. I have prepared some visuals that go along with the narration just to assist you in understanding the point that I'm trying to make. So as you watch this though, I would like for you, if you can, to keep an open mind and listen to 
the points that are made in this particular program and apply them to what you know about the residents, the families, and activities that were going on around this house during this time frame. And then when it's done, we'll have a final summation and then we'll move on from there. Hope you enjoy. The ability of a witness to give testimony in a judicial setting or to cooperate with law enforcement investigations without fear of intimidation or reprisal is essential to maintaining the rule of law. Increasingly, local, state, and federal agencies are enacting legislation or adopting policies to protect witnesses whose cooperation with law enforcement authorities or testimony in a court of law would endanger their lives or those of their families. Protection may be as simple as providing a police escort to the courtroom, offering temporary residence in a safe house, or using modern communications technology, such as video conferencing, for testimony. There are other cases, though, where cooperation by a witness is critical to successful prosecution, but the reach and strength of the threatening criminal group is so powerful that extraordinary measures are required to ensure the witness's safety. Witness Protection Authority a government, police, prosecutorial, or judicial authority overseeing and coordinating implementation of the Witness Protection Program and making decisions on such matters as admittance, duration of protection, measures to be applied, operational policies, and procedures. A person who has taken part in an offense connected with a criminal organization possesses important knowledge about the organization's structure, method of operation, activities, and links with other local or foreign groups. These individuals are known by a variety of names, including cooperating witnesses, witness collaborators, justice collaborators, and state witnesses. There is no moral element involved in their motivation to cooperate. Many of them cooperate with the expectation of receiving immunity, or at least a reduced prison sentence and physical protection for themselves and their families. They are among the main participants in witness protection programs. The combination of lenience in, or even immunity from, prosecution with witness protection is considered a powerful tool in the successful prosecution of organized crime. However, the practice can raise ethical issues as it may be perceived as rewarding criminals with impunity for their crimes. To address those concerns, a growing number of legal systems provide that the benefit to collaborators is not complete immunity for their involvement in criminal activities, but rather a sentence reduction that may be granted only at the end of their full cooperation in the trial process. Legislation and policy clearly separate admission to a witness protection program from any benefits that participants may be granted by the prosecution or court with respect to past criminal behavior, and they provide that justice collaborators must serve some prison time for their crimes. Within the penitentiary system, special measures are required to protect the life of justice collaborators. A special branch of the prison administration usually administers them in coordination with the protection unit. They include A. Separation from the general prison population B. Use of a different name for the prisoner witness C. Special transportation arrangements for in-court testimony D. Isolation in separate detention units at the prison, or even in special prisons. Sometimes prisoner witnesses commit new crimes after their release from prison and admission to the program and are subsequently terminated from witness protection. To ensure that their return to prison would not endanger their lives because of their previous cooperation, the prison administration may place them in an inmate monitoring program and house them separately from other prisoners who are known to pose a danger to them. Following their release from prison, justice collaborators may be resettled to a new, secret location under a different identity if the threat to their life persists and other conditions are also fulfilled. Family members of justice collaborators, however, may be admitted to the program while the witness is still in custody. Schemes have been developed that are distinct from witness protection programs but are still based on the principle of making it more difficult to trace at-risk and intimidated witnesses and their families. Those schemes apply to cases that do not warrant the permanent relocation and change of identity of the witness. 
They may be ordered in the pre-trial or trial phase and provide either for a series of physical security measures implemented by the regular police or for evidentiary rules enacted by the courts. Such schemes are often referred to as alternative measures to witness protection programs. Target hardening. Security measures should be considered in all instances where witnesses genuinely believe that there is an imminent threat or danger against their lives or their families' lives as a result of their involvement in assisting the police in investigating a criminal case. In the majority of cases, witnesses do not face a life-threatening situation. Instead, they suffer verbal threats, intimidation, harassment, assault, property damage, or simply fear of reprisal as a result of their cooperation with the police. To provide support and security to such witnesses, the police may put a security program in place. The program may be established either by law or as a policy. It would generally provide for a series of enhanced police measures to discourage criminals wanting to harm the witness. The measures taken would be proportional to the threat and of limited duration. They could include a temporary change of residence to a relative's house or a nearby town, b close protection, regular patrolling around the witness or their family's house, escort to and from the court, and provision of emergency contacts, c arrangement with the telephone company to change the witness's telephone number or assign him or her an unlisted telephone number, d monitoring of mail and telephone calls, e installation of security devices in the witness's home, such as security doors, alarms, or fencing, F, mobile telephones with emergency numbers, G, use of discrete premises to interview and brief the witness. The arrangement of temporary accommodation in safe houses for victim witnesses is among the measures widely used. In some cases, the accommodation is located in specifically designated housing units where witnesses can recover and where access is allowed only to support groups, such as non-governmental organizations, social workers, and medical staff. Such designated units for the protection of witnesses under threat may be of limited usefulness, since they are in locations known to the community and easily disclosed. For protection purposes, a safe house may not always be a static point, in other words, in a designated location. But any location not generally known as the usual residence of the individual under protection, where the police can monitor and control all access and communication. It can be as simple as an apartment or hotel room. So once again, when I suggest something, like for example, that this house could have possibly been a safe house, I don't do it just because I think, oh, well, that's you know what, I'm seeing this stuff, it looks like it could be a safe house. No, I do it because I'm very much familiar and have researched to familiarize myself even more with operations and procedures as it relates to the dealings with confidential informants. So when I suggest something like it's a safe house, I'm, you can bet I've, I've researched it. And I've applied it, and I've looked for indicators that suggest that that may, may in fact be a fact. But again, these are, these are my opinions. Now, going forward, we're going to start looking at a couple of other aspects of this case that I have brought up before. But as, as you continue to, to look deeper and deeper into things, more things seem to appear. And folks, when you're investigating something and you have a hunch and you start to follow that hunch to look for things that corroborates what your findings are and you continue over and over and over to find things that continue to corroborate what you're investigating, well, it's really difficult to go, okay, well, this is a dead end. Let me go look at the frat boys. I mean, it's very difficult to do that when you continue to look and you continue to find things 
that line up exactly with what it is that you're investigating. So I'm going to continue to bring those things to you as I find them. And then as I find enough of them, as you know, for, if you've watched me for some time, I find things, I find more things, and then I begin to plug those things into the big picture, and I'm getting a little bit closer to getting another big picture for you. So anyway, please like and subscribe to the channel. Post your comments, your thoughts, criticisms. Till next time, Bob Arati's out. Some citations, we'll catch you loose, okay? Sounds good, sounds good? All right. Good. Negative. He's been released from the scene. Thank you, though. Good. Negative. He's been released from the scene. Thank you, though. Good. Negative. He's been released from the scene. Thank you, though.